So uh, welcome all to this uh, uh, session. Thank you for joining. So we have started uh, now in about uh, one minute. So I just request uh, uh, the team right you know, to share the screen, please. Yeah. Uh, Nihal is trying, he's having some network issues, he's on college. Okay, uh, should I, should I share screen, screen for you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He's trying. Yeah. No, I can. I can also share. Uh, you know, screen for you if you want. Hmm? He has a star here, I think. The same link, right? I can share the screen for you. <coughs> share the screen for you if you want. We can we can get started. Malika. Yes, sir. So if you can share it's okay. It's fine. Yeah. I can share the screen. So so I hope you all can see the screen. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, how, uh, sir, you will be changing the slides. Yes, I will be cha changing the slides. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, if you want, you can also share the screen if you want. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so this is our BSc uh, uh, final year uh, students, the third year students who are doing their uh, so-called uh, bright project, uh, which is uh, towards their past, uh, partial requirements. You know. Uh, for fulfill for uh, for the fulfillment of BSc degree, so we are working on something uh, exciting, and uh, the last you know, presentation is going to be this uh, presentation. You're all welcome you know, to interact at the end of the presentation. So over to you, uh, Team Bright. So Malika, to start with, yeah, please. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon to one and all participants here. My teammates and I are here to present the research perspective titled The Omic Insights on Unfolding Saga of COVID-19, which was published online in the year 2021. It is published in the journal Frontiers of Immunology. Now, let us see what are the team right members. Michael Victor Day, Anagha Renzita, Ananda Krishnan P, Sunu Rodriguez, Akshara, Adriel Ann Nixon, Nihal Najib, Haripriya H, Aisha A. Jabbar and Abarna MD. Now on to the next slide. That is, uh, we'll get an idea about the contents in this presentation. Now over to the next slide. That is about the introduction. COVID-19 has been playing havoc with our lives since its inception. That is December 2019. The major reason for the virus still persisting is, is that the recombination of the viral genome. So that's also a major question we all have in our mind. Viral recombination occurs with viruses of two different parent strains who are in the same host cell and in fact the reputation to generate virus story have been gained from both the parents. So that is what is meant by viral recombination. So in this paper, the major findings pertaining to SARS-CoV-2 biology, which includes its symptoms, host, epidemiology, genome, and its emerging variants, and applications of machine learning and artificial intelligence effective management of COVID-19 and future pandemics is extensively discussed. Now, I hand over the presentation to Ananda Krishnan to explain about the origin, taxonomy, and host of coronavirus. Sir, next slide. Uh, so, origin, taxonomy, and host of uh, coronavirus. Coronavirus is a single-stranded uh, RNA virus that have a diameter of 65 to uh, 125 nanometer. 
they were named coronavirus due to the uh, appearance of a crown like spike structure on the viral outer surface coronavirus are uh, known to cause respiratory and uh, gastrointestinal tract infections in humans poultry and animals uh, these large groups of virus belong to the order uh, nidovirales uh, family coronaviridae and subfamily orthocoronaviridae which in turn is divided into four genera that is alpha alpha coronavirus beta gamma and delta coronavirus so among the seven uh, human coronavirus identified to date including the sars cov 2 two of them belong to alpha coronavirus that is h cov nl63 and h cov 229e and the remaining five belong to the beta sars cov mers cov and sars cov 2 so now let's talk on the uh, what the variants of concern coronavirus are known for the ability to rapidly mutate effectively cross the species barriers and adapt to a novel host environment uh, novel host environment uh, so out of the four genera alpha coronavirus and beta coronavirus are known to infect only mammals while gamma uh, and delta primarily infect the birds rodents and avian species uh, and are natural reservoir of uh, diverse coronaviruses so for example we take a uh, bats that is a uh, ranulophus species which were identified as a reservoir of more than 30 coronavirus including the sars cov so currently, uh, SARS-CoV-2 has been speculated to be uh, transmitted to humans uh, from bats through an unknown intermediate, uh, which still needs to be uh, conclusively proven. So here, uh, there's a possibility that humans might have uh, contracted an, uh, a virulent strain or a strain with a lesser virulence, directly or indirectly, and then the virus might have undergone virulence, enhancing mutations, resulting in a human-to-human -human transmission. Uh, which may be cause for the origin of SARS-CoV-2, but it remains to be proven with the more supporting data. So let's move on to the next. Now let's dive deep into the phylogenetic studies of SARS-CoV, which revealed that 79% similarity with the SARS-CoV and 89 to 96% similarity, and the two others like SARS-CoV isolated from the Chinese horseshoe bat, that is uh, Renalophus sinicus and uh, Renalophus uh, affinis respectively, so, how are these SARS-like coronavirus uh, differ significantly in their uh, receptor binding domain upon comparison? SARS-like coronavirus isolated from uh, malian pangolins, uh, that is uh, Manus uh, javinica, which shows 85 to 92% nucleotide homology and stronger similarity in the uh, receptor binding domain to the SARS-CoV-2. So, based on all these findings, pangolins and besides pangolins, Multiple species of uh, wild or domestic animals like camels, mink, uh, may also carry SARS-CoV-2. So whether or not the uh, suspected hosts are uh, naturally infected by SARS-CoV-2 from human remains to be proven. So next to talk about a disease phenotype, I'll hand over the presentation to Aisha. Thank you, Anandi Krishnan, for the wonderful demonstration. Uh, good afternoon, myself Aisha Jabbar, and I'll be dealing with the topic disease phenotype associated with SARS-CoV-2. As we all know that coronavirus is associated with many disease phenotypes, for example, like uh, it causes pulmonary dysfunction, we know that corona leads to pneumonia, and when this pneumonia progresses, more of the air sacs can become filled with fluid leaking from the tiny blood vessels in the lungs, which causes shortness of breath and can lead to lung failure. And other diseases like hematological alteration, which is a reduced platelet count, inflammation, which is mostly seen in adults, liver and kidney dysfunction, which may be due to the presence of the SARS-CoV-2, the inflammation induced by the disease. Cardiac muscle injuries, electrolyte imbalance, coagulation dysfunction are some other diseases associated with this COVID-19. And this coagulation dysfunction increases the risk of venous and arterial thromboembolism. Venous thrombosis is when the blood flows block a vein. Veins carry blood from body back into the heart. Arterial thrombosis is when the blood flows block an artery. This thromboprophylaxis protocol is implemented by treating COVID-19 patients. There are many other disease phenotypes associated with this COVID-19 which are still being discovered. Moreover, the diabetes, hypertension, cardiomyopathies like comorbidities make the disease management even more challenging. So, over to the next slide. 
some people may develop symptoms like fever, cough, high temperature, loss of taste. We all know the symptoms of corona. So uh, these people can be easily identified. But as a symptomatic individual, we may not be able to identify them. This it become more difficult and the viral transmission may also increase. Therefore, we need the serological markers to enable the identification of asymptomatic individuals. Antibody test is a screening test for COVID-19 antibodies in your blood. It tells if you were previously infected with the virus that causes COVID-19. The antibody test does not look for the active viruses, but it checks whether your immune system has responded to the infection. As we can understand, if that particular individual had a previous exposure to the virus. So on to the next slide. One of the most commonly used mathematical algorithms to describe the diffusion of an epidemic disease is the SEIR model, which we have applied to compute the number of infected, recovered and dead individuals on the basis of the number of contacts, probability of disease transmission, incubation and infection. So S is the susceptible individuals, means those able to contract the disease. E is the exposed individuals who have been infected but are not yet infectious. I is the infective individuals capable of transmitting the disease. R is the recovered individuals, those who have become immune. So on to the next slide. The susceptible exposed infectious recovered compartmental mathematical model for the prediction of COVID-19 epidemic dynamics incorporating pathogen in the environment and intervention. The next generation metrics approaches was used to determine the basic reproduction number R0. SARS-CoV-2 have an R0 value of 2.03. R0 is a term that indicates how contagious an infectious disease is. So if this R0 is less than 1, the disease will perish in the population and if this R0 is greater than 1, the disease will spread faster. So R0 of 2.03 implies that the pandemic will persist in the human population in the absence of a strong control measure. Results after stimulating various scenarios indicates that disregarding social distancing hygiene measures can have devastating effects on the human population. The model shows that quarantine of contacts and isolation of cases can help halt the spread of novel coronavirus. We know that what are the precautions that we take today, like wearing the mask, PPE. So uh, the virus can also affect other organs such as the gastrointestinal tract. SARS-CoV-2 uses angiotensin converting enzyme 2 as uh, a viral receptor for the entry process reported to be highly expressed in the gastrointestinal epithelial cells and this most common symptom associated with it is anorexia and diarrhea. In about half of the cases this viral RNA could be detected in the stool which is another line of transmission and diagnosis. So there is a need for the screening multiple clinical specimens for a from a single patient other than this nasopharyngeal sap, serous lungs and tracheal aspirate, blood, pleural fluid and the fecal gambles. And the and, uh, vertical transmission of the disease is also identified. That means that the fetus or the neonates can be infected from the infected mother. And uh, that's about my topic. Thank you. Now I'll be handling the presentation to Akshara. She'll tell you about the SARS-CoV-2 genome and its variant. Thank you, Aisha. Good afternoon, all. Myself, Akshara. I'll be talking about the SARS-CoV-2 genome and its variants. So, SARS-CoV-2 carries the largest genome size of 29.7 KB, and it has 16 non-structural proteins and 4 structural proteins. SARS-CoV-2 consists of 6 open reading frames, where OR of 1A produce the polypeptide 1A, and that will be cleaved to uh, 11 NSPs. And due to the ribosomal frame shift in ORF 1A stop codon, the ORF 1B yields another polypeptide, the ORF 1AB, and that will be further cleaved to 16 NSPs. Now, the figure shown here is the genome comparison of SARS CoV and SARS CoV 2, along with the ORF, in order to depict the common ancestry. Where are uh, the SARS-CoV-2 enters the whole cell and the positive strand of the viral RNA 
undergoes translation to synthesize the non-structural proteins. From the two protein coding genes, that is the ORF1A and ORF1B. So here in, in this case, this is cov 2 The ORF3B is absent because it has lost its activity of interferon antagonism. Now moving on to the next slide. It is the table showing the genes encoded by SARS-CoV-2 and their known functions. Next slide. Now, uh, now we are um, talking about the viral host interactions. So several viral structural and accessory proteins and a number of host proteins interact with the viral RNA. So according to the studies, SARS-CoV-2 SARS and MERS-CoV-2, they share many similarities and as well as differences in their genomic and phenotypic structure that is actually responsible for their pathogenesis. So as you can see in the figure, it is showing the 5' UTR and the 3' prime UTR and coding regions of SARS-CoV-2 SARS -CoV and MERS-CoV-2. The RNA polymerase of most of the RNA virus either lack or have poor proofreading activity. So as a result, the single-stranded RNA virus, they mutate faster and that allows the virus to evolve faster and develop resistance to the drugs, vaccines, and they can switch the host. Thank you. Now I have the slide to Nihal in order to explain the variance of concern. Thank you, Akshara. Uh, myself, Nihal, and I will be talking about the variants of interest and the variants of concern. According to the WHO, a variant of interest is a variant with a gene capability that affects characteristics of a virus, such as disease severity, immune escape, transmiss transmissibility, and diagnostic escape. The World Health Body further confirmed that variant of interest causes a consequential volume of community transmission. A global increase in cases in these cases causes a risk of large proportions to worldwide public health. Next slide, please. Based on the factors of severity of the virus and the ability to spread, they have been classified as follows. Epsilon, B.1.427, Zeta, P2, Eta, B.1.525, Theta, P3, Kappa, B.1.617, Lambda, C.37, and Mu, B.1.621. Next slide, please. Variants of concern. Variant of concern, according to the World Health Organization, translates to the rise in transmissibility, an increase in fatality, and a significant decrease in the effectiveness of vaccines, therapy, and other health issues. Based on these factors, uh, including the severity of the virus and the ability to spread, they have been characterized as follows. Alpha, B.1.7, Beta, B.1.351, Gamma, P.1, and Delta, B.1.617.2. Alpha variant uh, had much faster outspread rather than Beta and Gamma variants. Therefore, Alpha and Delta variants may potentially cause more in uh, sickness and increase the number of deaths globally. Monoclonal antibodies are less effective against Beta, Gamma, and Delta variants, while Alpha variant is known to be effective. And now, uh, to further continue the presentation, uh, I, uh, I bring about Hari Priya to explain about the hotspots and variants. Thank you, Nihal. Uh, I am Hari Priya, and I will be talking about hotspots and its variants. Researchers have identified several mutations in SARS-CoV-2 genomes. Uh, which makes the variants as hotspots. Eight no uh, novel mutations uh, were identified, which are additional to the previously identified five hotspots. From the eight uh, novel mutation hotspots, one was in the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase gene, which is involved in proofreading activity. A non-synonymous mutation had happened in RDRP gene, that is, a proline is changed to leucine, and uh, this change affects the proofreading ability by disrupting the interaction with other protein cofactors. 
This will also influence uh, the mutation rate and enhance viral replication, which in turn influence the mort mortality rate. Another importance of this mutation is that it may provide drug resistance to the virus because several polymerase inhibitors which are currently in clinical studies have targets that are adjacent to the mutation identified, but this needs to be experimentally proven. By introducing algebraic topology based machine learning, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and ACE2 receptor binding free energies were analyzed which helped in the identification of a number of mutations. Future SARS-CoV-2 uh, mutation may result in more infectious strains than the original Wuhan strain, which is the assumption made by uh, cluster analysis and uh, transmission dynamics. Phylogenetic analysis of approximately 1,400 SARS-CoV-2 genomes, which is isolated from India, yielded seven clusters. From these, one was unique to India and it contains three variants. In these three variants, amino acid changes are occurred in R of 1A, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, R of 1B, and nucleocapsid genes. Of these, the mutation A97B in RDRP has happened in its NIRAN domain. NIRAN domain is an N-terminal domain of the viral polymerase NSP12, which is essential for the replication of virus. Thus, this mutation has importance in RNA binding and nucleotidylation activity. The SARS-CoV-2 variant carrying D614G mutation in the spike protein is considered as the most prevalent variant. Some of the studies have shown that uh, this mutation mediates more efficient ACE2 mediated transduction and more efficient interactions. Among the three sublineages of B.1.617, the variant B.1.617.1.2 is considered as variant of concern by World Health Organization because this variant shows higher transmission rates and a reduced utilization by antibodies. Thank you. Now I hand over the presentation to Nihal for, uh, to further continue the presentation. Thank you, Hari Puraya, uh, for the presentation. Uh, now continue on to my slide. I will be talking about host pathogen interaction, comorbidities, and the immune response. Next slide, please. Virus element of any virus binds the host cell surface receptor for viral entry and multiplication. Uh, H-codes recognize protein peptidases as receptors also, except H-CoNL63 and HKU1, which recognize sugar molecules for cellular attachment. Certain examples of cellular attachments are, uh, example, H-CO229A for human amino peptidase, MERS-CO for human dipeptidyl peptidase, SARS-CO and HCO-NL63 for ACE2 receptor. Next slide, please. S-CRICO protein at viral uh, 70, uh, surface 71 mediates viral entry into the host. Now, the S protein have been uh, uh, divided into two subunits, S1 subunit and S2 subunit by the human protease, where the S1 subunit performs the receptor identification and the S2 subunit helps in cell membrane arrangement. The S1 subunit has been further divided into N-terminal domain NTD and C-terminal domain CTD, which plays, both of which plays an important role in functioning of receptor binding domain of SARS codes and MERS codes. Next slide, please. Crystal structure of HCO NL63 and SARS CoV receptor binding domain interactions with human ACE2 receptor uh, have been already shown in this picture. Now, crystal structure, composite structure of uh, S1 uh, C terminal domain of SARS CoV 2 and uh, human uh, ACE2 receptors reveals that most of binding residues are similar to SARS CoV binding sites. Buried in the exposed receptor binding regions from crystal structures of trimeric S protein of SARS CoV 2 is found to be consistent with structural characteristic of S protein in MERS CoV and SARS CoV. ACE2 receptor recognition is an important determinant of HCOV infection and pathogenesis. Therefore, it was assumed that SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain is less potent and exposed given the spike protein switching between lying down and standing up position. But the former buried position were in turn larger and therefore the masking regions are favored by immense evasion of spike proteins through ACE2. SARS-CoV-2 has different buried and exposed surfaces affecting the chemistry of pathogenic determinants besides the host. 
newly evolved runtime mutations in SARS-CoV-2 may impact disease severity and more uh, and humans may become more immunocompromised. Variant replications of many kinds when compared to its predecessor variants have been uh, seen uh, now these days. Therefore, whether or not vaccinated people have high chance to skip infection and transmission is under evaluation. Neutralizing of antibodies by body might be how the infection was evaded. Hence, study on Delta variants have been shown, which shows multiple mutations in F1 subunits, including receptor binding domain, uh, see, uh, seems, uh, seem to have concurrent epitopia. Hence, knowledge of system structure of interactions between host and viral proteins is a necessity for repurposing of existing drugs, but also for discovery of new antiviral agents. Next slide, please. We have developed a bona fide network of EBSCO host and transform networks, which could be uh, used to identify key putative candidates in interacting, uh, interacting pairs responsible for the viral pathogens in cells, as shown in Figure A. In Figure A, the given sub, uh, subnetwork illustrates EBSCO host and transform uh, di by differentiating into colored nodes and edge colors, where Colored nodes represent diverse enriched pathways in host proteins, and edge, co edge colors represent evidence character from protein protein interaction. The different colored edges indicate the following pink edges, experimentally validated interactions, green edges, fusion, gray edges, sub cellular locations, orange edges, co expression, and maroon edges, associations from text mining. From figure B, which is uh, next, uh, next uh, figure, we understand the way. Uh, various interplay of host pathogen interactions where yellow colored nodes represent viral proteins and blue colored nodes represent host proteins. In conclusion, the network largely explores how the interplay between SARS-CoV-2 proteins and uh, WAS proteins like spe uh, SPEC1, a mitochondria-like protein, BHP, a prohibition associated with cancer, and FGL2, fibroleukin thrombinase, a protein associated with protein factors and alveolar, macro uh, ma alveolar macrophage activation. Now, edge codes are uh, different viral proteins used for entry, and uh, B, uh, beta codes are uh, contain S proteins for cell binding and entry. Next slide, please. The factors affecting COVID-19 pathogenesis. Diabetic patients have high vulnerability to SARS-CoV-2 infection such as that a new treatment regimen along with administration of antihypertensive directed med uh, med 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 medications for diabetes in case of COVID-19 patients with diabetes. Post-COVID complication, namely mucormycosis caused by a group of fungi called mucormycetes, is a highly invasive opportunistic fungal function affecting the various vital organs including brain, eyes, ears, nose, throat, and mouth. It is popularly known as a black fungus and one of the factors for increasing the COVID-19 morb morbidity and mortality. Use of steroids can reduce inflammation in COVID-19 patients but makes the patient more susceptible to the opportunistic black fungus infections due to increase in blood sugar level and reduction in immunity. Other factors which enhance the sensitivity to infection include smoking, age, and obesity, and hospital acquired nos nosocomial infections, which requires us to do early diagnosis to find these opportunistic pathogens. Pulmonary disinfection. Asthma and bronchitis has also been reported to increase chances of SARS-CoV-2 associated morbidity and mortality. To predict the various environmental variants and comorbid conditions on progression of SARS-CoV-2 infection and vice versa, use of valuable tools like mathematical modeling and artificial intelligence can give us an edge. Next slide, please. Multiple uh, an association between ABO blood group and COVID-19. Multiple studies on association of ABO blood group and COVID-19 concludes that individuals with blood group A exhibit a higher risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection, morbidity, and mortality, while individuals with blood group O exhibit a lower risk of same parameters. Gullin et al. has demonstrated the inhibition of adhesion of SARS-CoV expressing cell, cells to ACE2 expressing cells by anti-A antibodies, explaining higher susceptibility of individuals of blood group A to COVID-19 infection. Further validation is required before blood groups can be used as prognostic markers. Next slide, please. Lower levels of vitamin D, A, and K appears to influence SARS-CoV-2 infection and disease progression. 
uh, therefore their deficiency is expected to be a potential risk for SARS-CoV infection and disease sever uh, uh, severity due to the multifarious roles of these vitamins which includes in, in, in innate and adaptive immunity, maintenance of glucose and blood glucose levels, integrity and functioning of skeletal and non-skeletal tissues among other functions. Uh, so vitamin D and K deficiency is uh, very important. Next, to continue the slide, uh, I hand over the presentation to Sunu you know, to talk about uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, hijacking mitochondria to induce infections. Thank you, Nihal. Moving on to my part, emerging evidence suggests that COVID-19 hijacked uh, mitochondria of immune cells replicates within mitochondrial structures and impairs mitochondrial dynamics leading to cell death. Mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell and are largely involved in maintaining cell immunity, homeostasis, and cell survival or death. Mitochondria have been known to be involved in inducing innate immune responses, primarily against viral attacks. Damage to the mitochondrial membrane during viral infection causes mitochondrial DNA to leak into the cytoplasm. In addition to the viral genome, cytosolic surveillance systems that recognize these cytosolic DNA termed uh, danger associated molecular patterns detect the presence of mitochondrial genome in the cytosome. The recruitment of macrophages and dendritic cells is triggered by the recognition of DNA by cytosolic DNA receptors, which initiates an immune response and inflammation. As a result, any changes to the mitochondrial membrane uh, during infection uh, may result in an increased immunological response, which could explain the COVID-19 clinical signs. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 may manipulate mitochondrial function indirectly, first by ACE2 regulation of mitochondrial function. And once it enters the host cell, open reading frames can directly uh, manipulate mitochondrial function to evade host cell immunity and facilitate virus replication. The ACE2 receptor and TMP RSS2, a transmembrane serine protease used by HCO to enter host cells, both have the ability to modify mitochondrial activity, which could allow the virus to use mitochondria to its advantage in spreading to surrounding cells. We previously demonstrated that SARS CoV 2 mutations can affect uh, mitochondria despite the fact that ACE2 is regulated by its basic mitochondrial function. Furthermore, mitochondrial localization markers have been discovered in the viral transcripts 5' and 3' uterine regions. Several SARS-CoV-2 ORFs, including ORF-9B, uh, ORF-3B, ORF-7A, and ORF-8D, have been found to be localized in the host mitochondria. The sequences are quite similar to those reported in uh, SARS-CoV-2. Sorry, uh, previous slide. Uh, SARS-CoV-2, indicating that SARS-CoV-2 transcripts are likely to able to localize in host mitochondria as well. Uh, moving on to this part, this slide. Uh, several SARS-CoV proteins have been found to interact with mitochondrial protein in the host, although the biological significance of these interactions is unknown. Codes uh, have been uh, reported to live in ER-derived double membrane vesicles to prevent host immunological responses, thus they have been adapted to live in mitochondria-derived vesicles for the same reason. The findings imply that mitochondrial hijacking is an important mechanism in SARS-CoV-2 infection and, the, and that medicine that specifically restore mitochondrial function and promote biogenesis could be useful uh, anti-inflammatory medications in COVID-19 treatment. Non-structural proteins uh, are being studied to see if they are an important part of this mechanism. While it's unclear how the virus RNA gets into human cells, mitochondria, it's possible that it interacts with ACE2 receptors to regulate mitochondrial function. Increased ACE2 levels have been demonstrated to improve mitochondrial function. As SARS-CoV-2 infection causes mitochondrial hijacking, it has a negative impact on cellular bioenergetics, resulting in asphyxiation and causing death. Now, Anaga will take over the presentation to explain about disease management of COVID-19. Uh, thank you, Sunu. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, all. Myself, Anaga. So, um, next, let's look into the disease management options of COVID-19. Uh, so, here the authors have actually looked upon various treatment options and repurposing the existing drugs, which may have the potential to become the COVID-19 treatment options. So, uh, so these are the few of the treatment options. So let's look into each of them. So next slide, please. So the first one is the antiparasitics, which are actually a class of medications which are used for treatment of diseases caused by parasites. 
Well, um, studies have found that antiparasitics such as hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine and ivermectin can be used against COVID-19, which is a viral infection, by repurposing the drug against it. Um, while some studies showed promising results, others were kind of inconclusive. Next slide, please. So next is the antiviral compounds, which are classic medications, which are uh, used against uh, viral infections. So antiviral drugs do not destroy their uh, target pathogen. Instead, they inhibit its development. So some of the antiviral compounds which showed the most promising outcomes include remdesivir, favipiravir, lopinavir, and ritonavir. So let's look into each of them. Next slide, please. So the first one is the uh, remdesivir, which is actually an analog of adenosin, and it acts by entering the cell and gets phosphorylated into remdesivir metabolite triphosphate, which acts on the viral nascent RNA and inactivates it by the premature termination of the RNA synthesis. Now here it's the favipiravir, which is yet another FDA-approved drug uh, against influenza virus, but uh, it has been shown uh, promising results, uh, which suggest that. Uh, it can be used against SARS-CoV-2 by inhibiting the viral RNA polymerase. Lopinavir and uh, ritonavir are HIV protease inhibitors, but they were also able to inhibit the T, uh, T cyanotrypsin-like cysteine protease, which is a TCL protease that hydrolyzes the viral proteins of the human coronavirus, with which the SARS-CoV-2 shares up to around 96% sequence identity. But uh, recent studies have actually showed that anti-HIV drugs have few to no effects against SARS-CoV-2. So next slide, please. So let's, uh, le uh, let's look into the few herbal medicines which have possible effects against the SARS-CoV-2. Quinfree pyru decoction, a QFPD, is mainly used as an adjunct treatment in China against coronavirus. So it is actually this Chinese word for length cleansing and detoxifying decoction. Uh, it contains around 21 herbal components optimized for the symptoms of COVID-19. It has accelerated the recovery of COVID-19 symptoms and also reduced the mortality rates. The next one is a pritanthrin, uh, which is yet another compound isolated from the leaf of the Chinese herb called as Strobilanthus fuchsia. So it actually displayed an antiviral activity against the human coronavirus NL63 in a cell type independent manner in vitro. And also in addition to this, uh, several active phytoconstituents, which are basically non-nutrient active plant chemical uh, compounds or bioactive compounds, which are responsible for protecting the plants were isolated and they were obtained from uh, medicinal plant species such as curcuma longa, which is turmeric, Lithania somnifera, which is ashwagandha, Phenospora cordifolia, which is giloy, and Osmum sanctum, which is kulasu. These are all under molecular docking studies to identify compounds with the potential to inhibit the SARS-CoV-2 proteins. So administration of oral curcumin with piperin as an adjuvant uh, symptomatic therapy in COVID-19 treatment could substantially reduce the morbidity and the mortality and also ease the logistical and uh, supply-related burdens on the healthcare system. Curcumin should uh, could uh, be a safe and a natural therapeutic option to prevent the post-COVID thromboembolic events. So here, uh, in this slide, it states about the... Um, MTDTI. So basically, in order to identify the potential new drug and the existing drugs for the treatment of COVID-19, different computational tools have been developed, such as the artificial intelligence, which can predict the structure of the SARS-CoV-2 proteins. So here the authors have taken molecule transformer drug target interaction, MTDTI, as an example. So with this tool, they were able to find atizanavir, uh, which is an anti-HIV drug, to possess the highest inhibitory potency against the SARS-CoV-2. So next slide, please. So molecular docking is a technique that predicts the preferred orientation, affinity, and interaction of a ligand in the binding site of a protein. So docking studies of mesalidin and heberin from mesala sativa with um, 3 protease showed an improved docking score uh, for ligand binding free energies compared to the chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, and favipiravir. A chemographic analysis of the anticorp structure activity information was actually obtained from the public database called as Kimball, which is an open data database containing all the binding and the functional information for a large number of drug-like bioactive compounds. Next slide, please. So by um, carrying out molecular modeling, docking, and molecular dynamic simulations for the viral protein RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, Elfiki AA built a model for the viral RDRP to test its binding affinity to some of the clinically approved drugs and its candidates. So after screening the, uh, screening the crystal structure of uh, SARS-CoV-2, PCL protease via the virtual docking predicted several promising drugs such as carfilzomib, erivacycline, valrubicin, lopinavir, etc. that can act against the SARS-CoV-2. 
In a similar docking study, along with the HIV protease inhibitors like lopinavir, acinapravir, indivavir, and ritonavir, new molecules including metivazone, which is an antiviral drug that inhibits the messenger RNA and the protein synthesis in pox viruses, along with two others, were predicted to bind and inhibit the 3CL protease of SARS-CoV-2. Next slide, please. So um, the synergetic studies carried out on lopinavir, oseltamivir, and uh, ritonavir showed that when used together, these drugs showed a greater binding affinity and inhibition of the viral protease proteins than when used alone. In another docking study, around 1.3 billion compounds from the uh, ZINC15 database were docked against the active site of the SARS-CoV-2 3CL protease using the deep docking platform, which provides a fast prediction of the docking scores. So here the authors identified the top 1,000 potential ligands for SARS-CoV-2 uh, 3CL protease. So the potential drugs from the ZIN-15 database were screened for their binding affinity for the S protein and the 3CL uh, protease of SARS-CoV-2. And the findings identified Zanamivir, Indinavir, and Saxinavir as compounds with the highest binding affinities for 3CL protease. The next slide, please. So for emergency use in India, 2-deoxyglucose, 2-DG, which is an anti-cancer drug, has been approved as an adjunct therapy against COVID-19, and it acts by inhibiting the host glycolytic pathway, anti-inflammatory actions, and interacts with viral proteins. Now I would like to hand over the present, uh, presentation to Abarna to talk about the machine learning heuristics and the artificial intelligence for COVID-19 management. Thank you. Thank you, Anika. Myself, Abarna. My topic is machine learning heretics and artificial intelligence for COVID-19 management. Next, next slide. Artificial intelligence and machine learning have offered an effective tools and algorithm to combat COVID-19 pandemics. A has been monitoring COVID-19 patients for in determining the mortality rates, disease cluster identification, disease diagnosis and management, contact tracing through geotagging. It was first used after the first outbreak, uh, those who to track those who are in quarantine. A resource allocation, it takes account of actual availability of resources, facilitating training of healthcare person, data management, and in predicting future pandemic outbreaks and disease spread. Computation tomography, positron emission tomography, it is an image testing which reveals the metabolic or biochemical function of a tissue or an organ. Lung ultrasound and magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, which use magnetic waves, are being used in the COVID-19 diagnosis. The AA can supplement a medical image based COVID-19 diagnosis, particularly reducing the diagnostic time. The application of deep learning to X-ray and CT scan image has resulted in the detection of COVID-19 with high accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity. Such applications also effectively differentiate the symptoms due to COVID-19 from bacterial pneumonia. So next slide. Intrinsic SARS-CoV-2 virus genomic signature in combination with machine learning alignment-based approaches have effectively fast, scalable, and highly accurate. Other applications and machine learning and AI include protein structure prediction, reverse vaccinology, which is used to approach to identify the potential vaccine candidates by screening the proteome of pathogen through computation analysis, identification of potential by using molecular docking, and automating the data collection and the transmission using cyber physical system sensing computation from the current and futuristic device like lab on chip which is a device which integrates several laboratory function on a single chip there are quite a number of diagnostic methods used to detect the sars cov2 for the detection of rna we use rt pcr that is real time reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction which is used for detecting the presence of genetic material in any pathogen as they know, it is a gold standard method for screening and diagnosis of early phase of infection. And it has certain advantages. It, it includes automation, which means human input is minimized and high throughput analysis and relative reliability, and also determine the relativity of viral load. But the occurrence of false positive and false negatives are high, also record thermocyclers, uh, which is add human uh, needed personal skills, and it is highly vulnerable. When it comes to RT LAMP, it is reverse transcription loop mediated isothermal amplification. LAMP is performed using isothermal amplification so that it doesn't require any specialized laboratory equipment such as thermocyclers and it can be performed at a wide range of pH and temperature. And also, it has faster test results. It is easy to use and sensitive as compared to RT PCR. Even so, 
lamp require more number of primers and thereby the chance of primer dimer formation contributing to false positive. For that same reason, primer designing is quite challenging. Multiplexing could be problematic and is less versatile than PCR and it, it takes less than one hour. One hour. When it comes to RP RPA, real time decombination is polymerase amplification. Its features are almost same as RT lamp, such as isothermal amplification, faster test result, etc. But in case of RT RPA, primer and probe de designing are less established and is less sensitive than RT PCR and RT lamp. And also, it requires high concentration of DNTPs. Sherlock. Specific high sensitivity enzymatic report for unlock. This method uses two methods that is, target amplification followed by CRISPR mediated nucleic acid detection and is one of the rapid methods for uh, nucleic acid detection method. Here, its mechanism involves viral RNAs transcribed first to produce the cDNA, followed by fluorescently labeled single standard DNA. Then the, the reported probes are indiscriminately cleaved either through FN Cas9 or Cas12 A RNA complex. Then alternatively synthesized the cDNA can be used for in vitro transcription. And thus the RNA produced will activate the nucleus activity of Cas13 A, resulting in the similar cleavage fluorescently labeled SSRNA in Cas12 based. Sherlock is highly sensitive and specific and also capable of detecting single target RNA or DNA molecule. However, the protocol optimization is challenging and also there are challenges associated with the DNA degradation because the Cas12 way depend on intact in vitro synthesized RNA. And Sherlock is also a multi step de detection process, usually take 40 to 90 minutes. Then for the detection of viral antigen we use. So next slide please. Viral antigen we use rapid antigen test. We know that antibodies specific to viral antigen are used to detect the virus. It is one of the most rapid methods which is easy to perform and interrupt. This requires no specialized equipment or expertise and it is more suitable for point care of diagnostics. It also has certain disadvantages such as high titer antibody which is produced within a month or a week are not sensitive and specific of nucleic acid based approaches and often the confirmation of negative result by rapid antigen test require the RT-PCR to rule out the infection and time taken for uh, it will be approx approximately 30 minutes. Thank you. Now I'm handing over Malavika for further explaining. Thank you Aparna. So now we have two more methods that is lateral flow assays and ELISA. So uh, about lateral flow assays, uh, what are the features? First of all, it will detect IgM and IgG antibodies very quickly. Then there's direct detection from plasma whole of finger blood and it requires a very amount of sample. And it also has long shelf life and the instruments or specialized expertise is not required in the case of lateral flow assays. But then there are also certain disadvantages to the same. That is, the confirmation of the negative results by rap rapid antigen test, it requires RT-PCR to rule out the infection. And it also requires highly purified antigen for accuracy. Then we have ELISA, that is enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. So over here, the advantages include it can detect both antigen and antibodies. It's highly sensitive in detecting antiviral antibodies, as well as it will allow for high, high throughput analysis. On the other hand, there are disadvantages, that is the clinical performance data is rare, then cross-reactivity has also been reported in the case of ELISA, and the cost per test is very high compared to the other tests. So on to the next slide. So coming to the conclusion part about this presentation, COVID-19 undoubtedly has turned out to be one of the most destructive pandemics in recent history, having a negative impact on all the aspects of human life. An exhaustive list of potential treatment options and repurposed drugs targeting various stages of virus life cycle are present, which are under further trials and studies. They have attempted to summarize the various critical findings pertaining to COVID-19 biology from detection to treatment. We also saw, saw about the origin of coronavirus, molecular modeling, docking studies, wave concern, as well as machine learning heuristic for COVID management. Further studies and investigations are very critical at this point in order to decipher more about mutations and recombinations in the virus. Next, I hand it over to Nihal to continue. Uh, 
the final topic for our presentation is the SARS-CoV-2 undergo uh, recombination. So uh, there are many types of uh, phases where we can think of where SARS-CoV-2 might have an undergone recombination, but the following have been uh, discussed uh, uh, by us sir and us and uh, have been notified, uh, ha uh, have been written down. The uh, the types of uh, the certain instances where they might have gone in a recom uh, undergone recombination are rapid or spur uh, spurious mutations in the genome. Uh, or uh, uh, in case of uh, certain uh, spurious mutations in the genome, it might have uh, helped, uh, uh, undergone uh, recombination. And uh, second point, uh, antimicrobial resistance. Due to many drugs being given to given to the uh, people, uh, people who have uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 might have been able to get antimicrobial resistance uh, throughout the uh, many different patients. Then, load of non-synonymous to synonymous mutations inviting greater chance of new variants to survive in the environment. Uh, the synonymous and uh, uh, non-synonymous mutations uh, ha help in creating non synonymous uh, mutations help in creating different types of proteins which help uh, help us in uh, making uh, different uh, species so the non synonymous mutations in this case must have helped us adapt to the environment better and adaptability or acclimatability adaptability of sars cov 2 might uh, might have also been a key point in it surviving for the last two years Epigenetics and natural selection. Natural selection uh, in epigenetics uh, in case of SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, is a major point as it has been able to survive uh, and uh, 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 establish many different types of and helping uh, and helping also uh, overcoming different uh, circumstances to reach the peak and uh, achieving many uh, mutations. Uh, finally, I th uh, thank our dear mentor Prashant sir for giving us an opportunity uh, to present this amazing review paper. I also thank my team members for giving their effort and time to create such a wonderful presentation. And lastly, I thank our particip participants who have given uh, who uh, used their uh, precious time to attend our uh, presentation. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you very much, uh, Team Dry, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, uh, we will from everyone, you know, Madhika, uh, Anaga, Aparna, Nihal, Haripriya, uh, Aisha, Akshara, uh, uh, Sonu, Anand. I think they have been, you know, absolutely wonderful. Uh, I think you know, we should have you know, some uh, quick QA questions. Is there any questions now for them, please, for the Team Dry? Please fix on your camera for a good uh, photograph as well. Any questions, please? Not protein, I will uh, ask you know, one or two questions you know, to the team drive. So, team drive, you know, I remember those uh, four or five methods you know, that were uh, evaluated, you know, uh, like uh, the LAMP assay, the nature assay, the normal RT PCR, uh, the rapid antigen test, okay, the RTA PCR, and all those kind of things. Uh, what is the common most uh, limiting factor or a very important thing you know, that? Uh, you as uh, microbiology uh, undergraduates would like to see. Do you see any 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 limitation or any important thing uh, among all these particular methods, reduction methods? Sir, most of the time, most of method give false result. Though. Most of the method show its disadvantages. It may give false result. Right. Maybe yeah. false positive or false negative. Right. That's, that's because of you know evolving uh, 
in a business like this. Um, but you know, there are still flows and that are automatically detected. And from time to time, the flows are, you know, withdrawn. And uh, the common most, of course, uh, uh, flows that are already there in the RTP cell is the most sensitive case. But there is still, you know, if you look into the even uh, the most sensitive case, even the easiest case, like the rapid antigen test, so even the uh, you know, common most RTPs here, or the lamp test, could you see, could you think of any one common mimicking factor? There are certainly false positives, and that's a get false positive. Could you think of that? So, uh, uh, you know, uh, this, this, you know, begets, you know, a very important question on... Uh, yeah, Manisha, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. But I can see that it's, it's, it's possible, it may not detect uh, for the patients who have the virus and some blood disease. Like, I think there's too many, like, tests detected. I mean, it won't be detected in the case of RTP. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it could be, but you know, if you take all this for you know, four to six meters, the common most limiting factor that uh, probably I could think of is you know, the flow detection. Okay, you know, uh, having you know those uh, specific you know type, I mean, there's something called you know type that that is trying to tell you. you know. So you have you know a small uh, region of your RNA, okay, uh, in the in, in the virus. That needs to be detected in the, in the simplest case, you are to be sure a lamp based assay or even a kind of an antigen specific you know, assay. Okay? That should be detected you know, in your particular sample. But sometimes you know, we get a lot of false positives. So we take lamp assay, we take RT or PCR, we take a few RT PCR, we take a, a rapid antigen test, we take a bilateral flow assay. The common most limitation is that kind of you know, flow detection. Okay? The flows are detected well. Then you know it could it could be okay. Leave, leave aside you know the easiest way to perform the test like that. So this is certainly a challenge, and this challenge you know, can be overcome by doing you know uh, identifying an accurate pattern. So there's something called you know for an immunity to be evaded. You know there's something called you know pattern recognition receptors. These are all the short signature sequences you know that you find in your sequence. If you can detect those sequences and consider them as codes, that can be a you know, wonderful you know, asset, you know, for your, uh, you know, uh, diagnostic uh, tests. Okay. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. So, um, still there is a kind of a challenge, you know, despite, you know, several, you know, cases have opened up, several, you know, uh, tests, you know, have opened up. You know. But still there is a kind of a limitation. Any questions to uh, the wonderful team, right? If not, uh, I'll request everyone, you know, to give a Something out of applause for them. Uh, I think they've done a very wonderful uh, job. I would just, you know, like to request everyone to switch on your camera, please. Then, uh, all smiling faces. We hardly see your faces you know, without masks. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Like to Uh, smile, okay, yes, another one, you all have 32 teeth, right, yes, yes, thank you, thank you so much, huh? thank you for your time, hmm? see you on Monday and have a great time, uh, take care, sir, thank you, 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 sir.